My name is Paul Samara, and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who battles with addictions to pornography, sexual behaviors, and lust. Yes. 24 years ago, I placed my faith in Jesus while attending college. However, 30 years ago, I began watching hardcore pornography. The insanity of my life before coming to grips with my denial was filled with deceit, secrecy, shame, and guilt, which led to living a double life. I was raised in a religious environment that was filled with growth, ritual, and tradition, all of which meant nothing to me. I only attended church because that's what my mom and dad told me to do. Nevertheless, I was instilled with the value of knowing the difference between right and wrong. And as a young boy, I would mock Sunday morning church by memorizing every part of it while making faces and trying to make my sister laugh. As I grew older, I only became more cynical because I could, because I could see that almost everyone's life during the week never represented the lives that they portrayed on Sunday morning. They were all living double lives, and I vowed to never become like them. Ironically, I found myself becoming just like them. I just hit it better than they did. It was 1981, and I was 16 years old. I was always very outgoing and very talkative with the opposite sex when it came to being friends. But when it came to talking to girls I was attracted to, I felt socially awkward. I remember having a couple of experiences when I tried to express my interests but the girls just slapped in my face, which led to huge feelings of insecurity and a lack of confidence. Because I felt so awkward and insecure, I felt like I wasn't in control of my life. I think that's why I was drawn to porn, because at least there, I had found some sense of being in control. Although I later discovered that was a lot. For example, in the world of porn, I didn't have to worry about how to have a conversation. In the world of porn, I could live vicariously through an imaginary character that women were instantly drawn to. However, at the same time, I began to experience a lot of shame and guilt because I knew that there was something instinctively wrong about what I was doing. I knew that I was sinning against God. I had rationalized in my mind that how I was living was only natural. After all, it's just what young men do, right? It's a phase of life that I would eventually grow out of or get married and the urge would fade away. Like Fast forward to the year 1985. I was 20 years old and I found my first girlfriend and I became sexually active. After being fully immersed in porn for four years, my idea of a relationship was somewhat strange. And just as in the false realities of the porn world, I never took the initiative to talk to my girlfriend in depth about anything. I never thought about what she might be or what she might be thinking or feeling. I was totally in in it for my own selfish needs and sexual gratification. Needless to say, she sought out someone else to fulfill this relationship needs, and I was left feeling crushed, confused, and guilty. Fast forward to the year 1987. I, while I was attending college, a total stranger, now a good friend, shared the gospel with me, and I placed my trust in Jesus. I had given my life to Christ, and for the first couple of years of my Christian life, they were filled with an amazing spiritual growth. What I didn't realize is that I would begin to slowly take parts of my life back. And it all began by choosing to watch just a little bit of porn. I thought, what harm could come of it? Surely God would understand. After all, nobody's perfect, right? But that would only be the start of a slow downward spiral of life beginning to spin out of control. The secret desires and the acting out of sexual behaviors that I thought were taken away from me were were only suppressed because, truth be told, I didn't want to give up those desires. Like one who struggles with substance addiction, I was willing to admit that I had a problem. I was unwilling to admit that I had a problem. I believed that I could quit at any time, but I didn't want to give up my drug of choice. Besides, I wasn't into anything deviant or morally vile, and I wasn't hurting anyone, or so I thought. The next 11 years of my life would be spent living a Christian life devoid of any spiritual power and shackled with addiction. My problem progressed from renting VHS movies at adult video shops to purchasing adult DVDs to watching triple X video clips on the internet. I could tell that my problem was progressively getting worse because of the frequency of my use and because the content that was once taboo was no longer considered taboo. 
Since I was in sales for a small company, I could easily spend 50% of my time of my workday indulging my addiction instead of beating the streets for business. I continued to go to church on Sundays and attend the occasional Bible study during the week in the hopes that some way or somehow, by miracle or by osmosis, I would be changed. But that never happened. My relationship with God was schizophrenic at best because I was trying to manage my life on my own terms. Inside, I longed to live a life that was free from porn, but I couldn't carry it out. Fast forward to the year 2004, where I met my beautiful wife, Jim. I was sure that my desire to watch porn would go away, or at the very least substantially uh, subside, but it only got worse. Less than a year into our marriage, my wife began to discover on several different occasions that I had been looking at porn. But on this last occasion, when she confronted me, I could tell that she was not only angry, but she was deeply hurt, and I felt horrible. I pleaded with her that I would change my ways. I went cold turkey for about three months. I thought I had hit rock bottom. But, long, but not long after that, I went right back to feeding my I just found better ways to lie and hide access to porn. I didn't realize how my addiction to porn began to eat away at me from the inside out. I began to withdraw and become more distant. I began to show less affection toward my wife. I became even angrier and on edge. I became more lethargic. I was less caring. And our, six, our, and our sexual intimacy was practically zero. And then I began to see signs of how my sin was affecting the gym. She seemed cold and disconnected. I could sense the disgust in her when she interacted with me, and I knew that I had lost any respect that she had for me up to that point. Fast forward to March 2010, Jen was offered a career opportunity here in the You guys still with me? Yeah. At this point in our marriage, it was pretty bad. Jen and I weren't talking much, and when we did talk, it always seemed like we were talking to each other either out of, out of anger or frustration. I knew our marriage was in a bad place, but I was too ashamed and too guilty to talk about it. Honestly, I was just hoping it would all miraculously work itself out. A move to a new environment would be a welcome change. It would be an opportunity to come clean about how I was living. But then the fear set it. Fears about losing my marriage, my family, losing everything. If I chose to be honest about what was going on within me and how I was living, I chose not to talk about it. I chickened out again. Three months later, we were on our way back to Medford, Portland, where Jen had a business conference. We were facing a drive home with not much to talk about. And then I began to hear the loud whispers of God, inaudible, mind you, that spoke to me in ways that I could understand. It sounded a little bit like this. Paul, here it is. Here's your last shot. I've given you numerous chances to address the issue over the last 23 years. I think I've been pretty patient, don't you? So here are your choices. You can either choose to handle it your way, or you can choose to handle it my way. If you choose your way, the S is going to hit the fan, and it's going to be bad. I mean, really bad. Or you can choose to do it my way, and it'll hurt. But I'll walk with you through the process. So what's your choice? It was then that I knew that I hit rock bottom. That, <clears throat> excuse me. That proverbial fork in the road moment. And in that moment, I almost chickened out again. But I took a deep breath, turned off the radio, and proceeded to have what I thought was going to be the scariest conversation I would ever have in my life. Actually, it wasn't so much a conversation, but more like uncontrollable, uncontrollable blubbering. I couldn't help myself. All those years of living a lie, all of the hurt that I had caused, all of the disappointment that I had become, came gushing out of my heart like a newly discovered poison. And I remember look, the look on Jen's face. It was not the look I was hoping for, you know, the one of instant forgiveness. It was more like a look of shock, mixed with a little smile, mixed with a little look of it. <laughs> but to her credit, I could tell she was holding her tongue and trying to comfort me as best she could. And in that moment, 
I remember that God said it would hurt, but not nearly as bad had I chose to handle it my way. And I took great consolation in that reminder. I remember the experience of that of freedom that I felt. I literally felt like a slave whose shackles had been unlocked for the first time. It just so happened that prior to all of this going down, we had been looking for a church to call home. We had visited several different churches in the area. Prior to visiting New Beginnings, I remember driving past this church and my wife asking me, hey, what do you think about that church? And I remember rolling my eyes and thinking, yeah, right. Well, God has a funny sense of humor. While visiting, while visiting, it just so happened that Jen had met Lisa Greatman, the children's ministry pastoral shepherd. Lisa's husband, Craig, is the, ministry, is the leader of the ministry called Celebrate Recovery. And Jen said to me, you will talk to him now. <laughs> so I spoke with him that very next Sunday. And it just so happens, to hear a recurring theme here, that Craig struggles with some very similar issues. Coincidence? I say no. Providence. I remember him identifying with so much of what I had been telling him that I felt safe enough to confide in him. To be able to do that was huge for me and was the beginning of the healing process. He suggested I become part of a CR 12-step group, and I agreed. By going through the Celebrate Recovery 12-step program, I learned two very important things. Number one, God restarted the good work that he began in ending almost 24 years ago and will bring it to completion. I began to understand that I am a new creation, that I don't have to listen to the voice of my old master, that I can begin again, and that I can have hope. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The first I began by calling my own John. In other words, I admitted that I had a problem, and I needed help, and that problem had become my addiction, and that addiction was to sexual sin. Number two, I learned that being honest, speaking frankly, and being transparent with one another about our hurts, habits, hangups, and addictions is absolutely critical to discovering the true freedom that can be found only in Jesus. God's Word confirms this concept in First John 1, verses 6 and 7, says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Because I spent so many years trying to know more about God, I now understand that it's not about knowing more about him. It's about being known by him. 1 Corinthians 8, 2 and 3 says this, The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. I can now honestly and truthfully say that God knows me. Not, not that I know God, but that he knows me. It is, it is a knowledge that humbles me to this day and will humble me for all eternity. As a testament to the faithfulness and the goodness and the power of God, to be able to work with anyone who struggles with hurts, hangups, habits, and or addictions, I want to share just a few experiences where I've seen the hand of God working in this addict's life. A couple of months ago, we had just come home from a Friday night CR service, and my wife, uh, service, and my wife, my son, Jax, and I were sitting in our living room, uh, just talking and chilling out. And suddenly, Jen began to cry, and I asked her what was wrong. She said that for as long as we've been married, this was the happiest that she has ever been. And I knelt down beside her, and we just hugged each other. We cried together as I felt God's gentle grace pouring down on us like rain. 
to reflect and to see how God saved us, where God is leading us, and how God is restoring us full circle is simply amazing. There was a time in my marriage when my wife had no confidence in me, but now my wife has full confidence in him and in you. There was a time in my life when I tried to lead others in my own power, only to meet failure and frustration with no one following But now I have been given, I have been given the privilege to serve in his power and presently serve as a group facilitator for a CR 12 step group. There was a time in my life when no one would hire me, let alone look at me for my feeble video skills. But now that the world refused, God, God saw fit to use, and I am presently using my strength and talents uh, during our worship times to help others in recovery. There was a time in my life when I thought only about myself and I was a pessimist. But now God has remade me to be an accountability partner. Accountability partner and an encouragement to others. I was once a slave to my addiction, but now I am free. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I say these things to give you hope. There is nothing Jesus, Jesus cannot do in you and in me. I do not wish to apply or paint with rose-colored glasses. My rose recovery has not been. There are still many challenges to be faced. The difference now is I have hope. I would like to close with these words of encouragement to you. If you have not put your trust in Jesus at your higher power, you can find true freedom from your addiction in Him. If you have put your faith in Jesus, Never forget who you are in Him. For this will be the key to unlock the shackles of your past. Here is a song written by Jason Gray called I Am New. And the lyrics of the song meant so much to me in my recovery. And my prayer is that they will mean just as much to you in your recovery. Forgiven, beloved, hidden in Christ, made in the image giver of life, righteous and holy, reborn and remade, accepted and worthy. This is our new name. This is who we are now. And this is who I am. Thank you for letting me share this.